morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're watching from. My name is Michael Poon, and today I'll be talking about constraining the circumbinary disc tilt in the KH15D system. This work is supported by the Center for Planetary Sciences at the University of Toronto, as well as the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. My work has been supervised by Dr. JJ Zanazi and Dr. Wei Zhu, who is actually now a professor at Tsinghua University. So the motivation for my work is, can we measure the warp or the tilt in protoplanetary disks? Now, previously, this actually has been done for broken protoplanetary disks. Marino et al. measured a fairly large warp in the HD142527 system between the inner, about one AU sized ring, and the outer, about 100 AU sized uh, outer disk. They use a polarized light radiative transfer to do these calculations. Whereas what we're trying to do is a little bit different. We're instead using photometry, radial velocity, to measure relatively small, small warp in um, a protoplanetary disk that is not broken. Um, it's singular. And we try to fit a warp, which is, tends up to be pretty small. And hence the name of our work, constraining the circumbinary disk tilt in the KH15D system. And here's a visualization, which I'll be explaining more uh, very quickly of what we think the circumbinary disk could look like. But first a background, what is KH15D? Discovered in 1998 by Kearns and Herbst, hence the KH. This system is a young spectroscopic binary at an age of about 3 million years and a total mass of about 1.5 solar masses. But what's super interesting about this is that it has a light curve that's very unusual. It has this kind of w shape like looking thing, which is periodic every 50 days and dips by almost up to like five magnitudes. Very unusual. And 15 years ago, Eugene Chang, Josh Wynn, best described this as a circumbinary disk, which is processing and opaque. So now I'm gonna to try to give you an intuition for how this model um, can produce these light curves. So what we do is you can imagine just like a sheet of paper in the sky, right? As a kind of like a proxy for a disc, not actually, um, but you imagine it and it's opaque. So you have the sheet of paper and it's covering these, uh, this binary star. Now, since the disc moves at a much slower rate compared to the binary, you can almost imagine it as stationary for this um, theoretical thought experiment. Um, and so there are five stages for how the, the binary evolution um, evolves as it orbits. The first stage is you, you see the light from the, the small star, and then as it orbits, eventually both the stars kind of peek behind the, the culting disk. And then very briefly, the large star peeks out quickly, peeks back in, and then the um, the small star peaks out again, and you have this W-shaped like looking light curve, which is periodic. And depending on the, the location of where this occulting disk is, the light curve dynamically evolves into something that looks like this. If the, like, um, if the disk is at a different orientation, different location, or something like this, where, if, where the W is actually a little bit deeper in the middle. And so next, I'm gonna be trying to explain what we think this KH15D's protoplanetary disk could actually look like. Um, and so what we think is a, a set of circular rings. This is a simple model. So you have a set of circular rings and between this ring and then the next ring outside, there's a bit of an inclination or a bit of a warp. So it's not actually flat. It's not a flat disk. And here's a visualization where the inner ring is this red dotted ring it's actually circular, but we're looking at it from an angle. So that's why it looks elliptical, but it's really not, um, at least in our model. And as you go out, 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 you have this uh, outer yellow ring, which is what you see along the edge here. And on the right-hand side is an inset of a zoomed in portion of a 2D sky projection of our model. This helps the calculations go much, much easier since everything's in 2D if you just take the sky projected plane. And so our model has three main components. You have the binary star uh, of KH15D, so the star A and star B, and there are 
five orbital parameters associated with it. There's also a halo glow, which tells you how the brightness of the star dips off exponentially as um, you go beyond the radius of the star. And finally, you have the disk model parameters, which um, kind of relate to this sheet of paper we had in the sky we talked about before, except the sheet of paper is not as accurate. What actually happens is you have these two infinite long, infinitely long edges that are like kind of perfectly opaque, but they can have a different angle. Um, that is given by the uh, theta L for the leading edge, which is in front, and the tailing edge behind theta T, sub T. As well, it has these Y, L, and Y, T values, which are the Y intercepts along the sky projected plane, which evolve uh, independently over time, which basically allows this disk to kind of stretch or shrink over time. And so we fit our model using MCMC and we get these model fits, which turn out to be so. But what's what I wanna highlight in this slide is the fact that there are these orbital contact times, which are kind of important parameters, which connect the disk parameters to the um, binary, binary parameters. So you take the, the edge and when it lines up with the tangent of the, the orbit of the binary, then there are these orbital contact times. There are five for each um, one for, for, sorry, five for the leading edge, five for the tailing edge. There's T1 all the way to T10. Our model uses values up to T6 because that's the time we have data up until, but T7 and beyond actually haven't been observed yet, but we, we can make predictions for these for these things up to about T10, which is about 2050. So now that here's the fun part, we're going to be looking at what the data looks like and how that compares to the model. So in black is the model, blue is the data. So what you're looking at here are each panel. There are light curves that are folded every 50 days for some sort of uh, time period, about a, about a year. And so this light curve dynamically changes over time but what we've done in our work, which is new, uh, first of all, is that we fit it for so much more data. I'm gonna scooch over to the side so we can look. And it seems like we actually fit the data pretty well. And this light curve is dynamically evolving. There's a lot of rich behavior that is going on. So I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to pause and take a deeper look. Another way to look at this light curve is, in, is as if it was unfolded. So kind of the big picture view, it's even more clearly see that the light curve can kind of dip from up to like five magnitudes. And um, what I would also want to point out is about 2010, this is when the width of the disk kind of covers um, the binary such that the greatest distance between the two stars at all points in the orbit is smaller than the width of the disk. So the whole system is actually super dark for a short amount of time. And so in order to connect these observations to theory, what we do is we generate a self-consistent warp disk model, like so, basically looking at how a test particle orbits an eccentric binary. And we do that by rotating the circular ring, um, using secular dynamics, in a bunch of rotation matrices, and when, what we really care about is this inclination of the ring relative to KH15D's orbital uh, plane. And in order to make a disk, instead of just like a ring, like this test particle ring, you repeat it for another ring. So you have an inner ring and an outer ring, which gives the disk radial thickness as well as warp delta IR. And so our model fits look like so, where you have the angle between the x-axis and the leading edge is theta, the y-intercept, um, and same for the tailing edge. And um, what is important to see are these model fits, which basically show, um, I'm gonna scooch to the side. So the disk precession rate is about 6, 000, uh, 600 years. The inner disk radius is about 0.5 AU. 2 AU, an inclination, an outer inclination of about 13 six, and six degrees, and inner twist or a longitude of the ascending node at 100 degrees and then 115 degrees. 
Those are our fits. And just as a reminder, the picture of our protoplanetary disk, our set of circular um, rings with non-zero inclination, like so. And next, now we can label an inner radius and an outer radius at 0 0.5 and 2 AU, as well as an inner and an outer inclination. Now the theoretical implications are of the disk and warp mechanism. Now the disk warp, which is this delta I, and this twist, which is this delta omega, are consistent with hydrodynamical theories of accretion disks. And the way this warp can be controlled is that you have self gravity, which may support the warp, but it's kind of less likely, more likely is thermal pressure. And the observational implications, um, this is my final slide, is the fact that um, the disk alignment time scale we calculate to be about a thousand years using the Bay time scale. And now it's very unlikely that this disk is actually 1000 years. So there must be some sort of like initial, additional mechanisms that actually support um, uh, the, the, the inclination of the disk, but it's not particularly clear at this moment. Further work needs to be done. And finally, circumbinary disks are usually discovered by non-Likert methods, spectra, IR, and, and et cetera. But our work is unique in that it's the first to actually estimate the disk inclination via Likert analysis. And so it provides uh, an avenue for future work in discovering more circumbinary disks using this new method, which will be really exciting and hopefully um, people will conduct it in the future. Thank you.